Hey folks, this is Professor Vitt, and I am here with you working through mock exam number two. The, um, a couple of things, uh, all the questions that I review in this particular video will be the ones that constitute your final exam. So, um, if you can follow along with this video, you're in good shape. Um, importantly, a couple of things. Number one, um, the order of these questions will change, and the order of the answers and some of the silly answers will change as well. So it won't do you any good, obviously, to memorize one is true, because when I compile the final exam, uh, I'll very likely change all that stuff around. So try to focus on the, the understanding in this video rather than um, the order, you know, one is true, two is whatever. Um, and then, um, secondly, I would, um, just let you guys know, I'm going to do my darndest to go as quickly as possible here. Um, I understand that you've, your time is very precious. Um, and this mock exam only has on it, let's see, 35, uh, I'm going to remove this one. I wasn't going to do anything with it. Um, it has only 35 uh, possible questions. That's actually not very much. So, it, and many of those are short answer. Um, number of them are true, false. So, um, when you combine that with the fact that we worked a number of these in class, you're sitting pretty, pretty well here for the finals. So, um, let's get started. Um, all right. Exam number two, true, false. Here we go. Number one, a necessary object is one which always exists, but a contingent object is one which has come into being and then goes away. That is true, remember? We are contingent objects. There were times when none of us were alive, so say in the 1800s, none of us were alive, and there will be a time when none of us are around anymore, and that would be, you know, 2300 or something like that. So this is important because it comes in later with discussion of the cosmological argument for the existence of God. <clears throat> Number two, according to Mill, a few people have authority to decide questions for all humankind and exclude every other person from the means of judging. False, that is false. Remember, John Stuart Mill is a liberalist and he believes, or a liberal, not in a political sense, but in a philosophical one. And what he means here is that people are entitled to make up their own minds on things. Number three, Leibniz argues that the explanation of all contingent objects must be a necessary object, and that necessary object is God. True, that is correct. Number four, the ontological argument for the existence of God argues that the existence of God is guaranteed by our own concept of God. True or false? The answer to that is true. Number five. Remember, the ontological argument was the one where you say God's, the definition of God would be a being greater than which you couldn't think of, and somebody would say, okay, that's true, but, and you're thinking of that, yes, I am, but what would be greater than that? Your idea of the thing or your idea of the thing with the thing actually existing, and then it looks like you're in a trap. Number five. The cosmological argument for the existence of God argues that the existence of God is guaranteed by the elements of design which are detectable in nature. False. Remember, that's the teleological argument. Number six. Hume's treatment of causality can be understood as generally related to the problem of induction. That is true in the following sense. The question is, what is, um, can we establish philosophically, can we justify philosophically the uniform um, nature as a uniform thing? Can we establish the uniformity of nature? Number seven, neither the future nor necessity can be perceived means if causality is necessity or constant conjunction and our knowledge comes from experience, then our knowledge of causality is limited because we can never perceive the future or necessity itself. That is true. It is a mouthful, but it is true. Number eight, Leibniz contemplated a binary computer, a physical one, centuries before humanity developed a microprocessor. True. Number nine, Leibniz claimed that the mind and body run on parallel tracks, but he does so in a strange way, arguing from his position on the existence of monads. True. All right. Number 10, which of the following best describes the conclusion of the ontological argument? 
A, thus a being greater than which cannot be conceived must exist. B, God exists. C, such a being exists. D, by virtue of the power of Grayskull, Skeletor has risen. E, thus God does not exist. The answer to that one is B. Remember, the ontological argument wants to conclude that God exists. If you picked A, it wouldn't have been a terrible answer, but it wouldn't have been the best one. A is a version, a medieval version of the argument. Number 11, quote, yes, but if you were alive in the 1950s, then you would believe gay marriage is wrong, end quote. Which of the following arguments is this speaker making? A, never troubles him that mere accident has decided which of these numerous worlds is the object of his reliance, and that the same causes which make him a churchman in London would have made him a Buddhist or a Confucian in Peking. B, the opinion may possibly be true. C, it is not the minds of heretics that are deteriorated most by the ban placed on all inquiry, which does not end in the orthodox conclusions. D, when someone calls you a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe because you happen to disagree with them about tax policy or same-sex marriage or abortion, that's bullying. Okay, which of these? D is clearly a distractor. C, B, and A are our options, but really A is the best one. And this is the essence of the argument made. And people make this argument in different contexts, but the idea is sometimes people say this with regard to geography. So they'll say, oh, you are, uh, say you are a Republican because you um, are living in a rural county. And the idea seems to be that that's just an accident of nature. You could have been born in an urban place and it seems like the only thing you're relying on there is the accident of history to determine what political views you ascribe to. That's essentially the same argument. So A is our best answer there. Number 12, according to Mill, a ban placed on inquiry or speech places the greatest harm on A those who are not heretics and whose mental development is cramped and their reason cowed by the fear of heresy. B, those who are the heretics because their freedom of expression is violated. C, those who are indifferent, they are deprived of both sides. D, liberals claim to want to give a hearing to other views, but then are shocked and offended to discover that there are other views. Okay, the answer here is A. Remember, Mill thinks it's bad for people who are not able to um, express their non-standard views, but the people who really lose out on a restriction of speech is the people who are not heresy, the people who just simply cannot uh, express alternative views because those views are suppressed. The idea is alternative views are very good for you. They give you a more full picture of the truth. So the answer there is A. Number 13. Clean feels very strongly that Donald Trump has committed a conspiracy to defraud the United States. When Wash asks Clean for his specific evidence, Clean says, quote, I don't have any, but my mind is made up, end quote. Which of the following statements would characterize Clean's position? A. The night begins to shine. B. Clearly, Clean does not think it is necessary to suppose that his opinion, of which he feels very certain, could be an example of the error of which he should take precaution against. C. Clean has a living truth here, not a dead dogma. D. Clean wants to silence other opinions by universalizing his own. E. Succulents are a remarkably unusual form of plant life because of their unique regenerative vascular system. Okay. E is a distractor. E doesn't quite make sense. Remember, Clean's not silencing anyone's opinion. He's just stating he doesn't have any evidence for it. In that case, C has got to be wrong because Clean would just have a dead dogma. He wouldn't have a living truth because he doesn't know how to reason his position or justify his position. He simply accepts it as true. A is an obvious distractor. By process of elimination, B is the correct answer. And the idea is, think about it like this. If you are unwilling to look at evidence, if you are unwilling to entertain the other side, the mistake that you make is in thinking that you are infallible, that you are beyond error. But of course, no one's beyond error, and that's the real problem. So you shouldn't suppress anyone. You shouldn't, uh, yeah, there we go. We'll just keep going. All right.
All right, 13, that's me. Number 14, which of the following best describes the impact of the following argument? Premise one, the devil by definition lacks every perfection. Two, existence is a perfection. Three, the devil lacks existence from one and two. Thus, the devil does not exist from three. A, Descartes has proven the devil does not exist. Take that, Church of Satan. B, Descartes' ontological argument for the existence of God is so strong it shows the devil does not exist. C, Jon Snow is not Jon Snow. You know I'm changing that answer after that Game of Thrones finale. You ain't gonna see anything like that again. D, Descartes' ontological argument seems to have the implication that the devil does not exist. This is a problem because it would violate church dogma and get Descartes in trouble. That is correct. D is our answer. It's very, very close to B, but D is a little bit better because it tells us why it would be a problem for Descartes. Number 15, which of the following is an objection to the ontological argument? A, it has strange results, which suggests it is incorrect. B, it has strange implications, which suggests it is incorrect. C, it has strange implications, which suggest it is incorrect, for example, or for instance. <sighs> Sorry. One can run the same argument with a shootacorn or an imaginary perfect island to show that these things must also exist. D, there cannot be an objection to the ontological argument. Lo, it is too boss. Okay, the answer here is C, right? Um, Remember, uh, we ran through some of those in class, but the idea is just because you can imagine something that is perfect, a perfect island, right, S um, such that it has all perfections, it's the best beach in the world, it has the beautifulest water, the most serene blue sky, the most delicious coconuts, from the fact that you can imagine such a perfect object, it does not then follow, uh, it does not then entail that the object in fact exists. Number 16, why does Zara Yacob flee for his life from King Susanenos? And I think I've pronounced that right, but I'm, I'm not sure. So I've gotten it wrong. Uh, I apologize. A, he had relations with King Susanenos' daughter. As a commoner, this was an absolute no-no. B, no, he is a genius. He just can't claim it. Because they left him no platforms to explain it. He frustrated so he get faded, but deep down inside, you know you can't fade him. C. Zara Yacoub was falsely accused of misleading the people to expel the frog and kill the king. D. Zara Yacoub was correctly accused of telling people to expel the frog and kill the king. Our answer here is C. Remember, Zara Yacoub, according to his account, was the victim of false uh, accusations and he fled for his life. We fix this here. Seems all wrong. Okay. Um, now let me fix this just a moment. There. Sorry, everybody. Boom. There we go. It's perfect now. I know. It looks good. I get it. It looks good, okay? Number 17. Why does Zara Yacoub fleeing for his life make him a modern figure? A. Zara Yacoub did not flee for his life. B. He represents a new form of the individual. How that individual relates to the state or the ruling elements in society. C. Socrates also fled for his life. That does not make him modern. <sighs> D. Running so much, Zara Yacoub developed a physique that was trim and fit. That's what modern means. Okay, D is obviously a distractor. C is an interesting observation, but that's not what we care about. So we're between A and B. Well, we know A is wrong. He did flee her for his life, so B. Again, Zara Yacoub is this kind of um, rekindling of this idea that an individual might have views that are different from the rest of society. This is a sort of, these questions of conscience and tolerance are really uniquely modern and values of the enlightenment, sort of. Number 18. Which of the following best explains how premises three and four combine to ensure five is true? All right, so here we go. 
Premise one, God has the idea of infinitely many universes. Number two, only one of these universes can actually exist. Three, God's choices are subject to the principle of sufficient reason. That is, God has reason to choose one thing or, or another. Number four, God is good. Number five, therefore the universe God chose to exist is the best of all possible worlds. Now remember, what we are looking for here is how three and four combine. So let's, let's read these out. A. God has a reason for doing what he, she, they does. Because God is also good, his, her, their reason for creating the world would be to create the best world that he could. That would mean that this world could not be improved upon because it is already the best one possible. Ain't bad, right? Why don't we hold on to that and look at the others? B, God has an infinite number of universes that he, she, they could make. Because God is good, he, she, they pick the best world because that is what his, her, their goodness allows. C. Once there was a way to get back home again. D. God has no reason for doing what he, she, they does. This is because God is not subject to explanation or justification in any way. That means that the world cannot be improved upon because such an improvement would require an explanation. All right. D we can eliminate because it's false. Remember, um, most of these thinkers, and this is Leibniz, really believe in the principle of sufficient reason. So that would be premise three, so D contradicts it, so that's wrong. C is just a reference to a Beatles song. I know. B, God has an infinite number of universes that he should... Okay, so B ain't bad, and A ain't bad. Thank God. I'm so sorry. A is going to be a little bit better because it's a little bit more complete. So between those, A is the better one. All right, number 19. Scientists originally believed that all swans are white is true. When Europeans found black swans in Australia, there was a debate that the definition of swans could be changed to include only white swans. Which of the following best describes this event in human terms? Okay, so remember this is the scenario we talked about in class. A, the original question about whether all swans are white is true is a question about relations of ideas. Relations of ideas are propositions which are true in virtue of the world. When attempting to make all swans are white true by defining swans as white, this now becomes a question about matters of fact. Matters of fact are propositions which are true by virtue of the concepts involved. B. The original question about whether all swans are white is true is a question about matters of fact. Matters of fact are propositions which are true in virtue of the world. When attempting to make all swans are white true by defining swans as white, this now becomes a question about relations of ideas. Relations of ideas are propositions which are true by virtue of the concepts involved. C. Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Malcolm X. D. All swans are white consists of two different concepts, constant conjunction and necessity. All right. D is a distractor. C is a beautiful quote from Malcolm X. So we're dancing between A and B. And even if you weren't quite sure what it was asking, if you understood that matters of fact are propositions that are true in virtue of the world, then you'd get it right. So B is actually your proper answer here. Remember, relations of ideas are sentences about our concepts. They're sentences about our ideas, and so they're true by virtue of the concepts that are involved. So B is our better answer. A is the same answer, but I flipped the labels. All right, let's keep going here. Number 20, all silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility, means which of the following? A, if you do not restrain another person's speech, you have confused your own personal certainty with absolute certainty. B, if you know it in your heart, it is true. 
C, personal certainty is enough to silence and eliminate opposing viewpoints. D, if you restrain another person's speech, you confuse your own personal certainty with absolute certainty. That is, it could be wrong. All right. C is incorrect. All right. Personal certainty is enough to silence and eliminate opposing viewpoints. The answer there is no, because this quote says, if you try to silence somebody, you assume that you're infallible. So there's no way that you would be justified um, in silencing and eliminating opposing viewpoints. So C is bad, B is a distractor, so you're between A and D. Now, you might pick A, but remember, I've got a, it's a trick, it's a trap, okay? Admiral Akbar was talking about it being a trap in, um, in Star Wars. Here it is right here. Um, if you do not restrain another person's speech. So that little not in there makes A a bad answer. D is the best answer. The idea is let someone talk, right? Um, you always have to guard against your own error. Number 21, complete the following passage from all minus one. Here we go. Not the violent conflict between parts of the truth, but the quiet suppression of half of it is the formidable evil. There is always hope when people are, A, forced to argue both sides, B, forced to listen to both sides, C, die before anyone, B, C, die before anyone can disagree with them, D, forced to keep quiet. All right. Best answer here is B. Um, C is a little bit of a distractor. D isn't right. Remember, we want to encourage different viewpoints, not suppress them. So you're talking about A and B, but the idea is we're not concerned with arguing both sides, but to listening to both sides. So B is the better answer. All right. Number 22, complete the following passage from all minus one. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not know so much as what they are, A, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. B, he has a ground to listen to both sides. C, he has pledged himself to the opposite side. D, try to teach some values and they all erode away. You're lucky if they listen to a single word you say. I'll let you guys Google that on your own. All right, um, the answer here is A. He has no ground for preferring either opinion. Remember, it's not enough to believe the truth if you don't know the reasons for having that belief. You need to know why you prefer that side. In order to do that, you have to be able to refute the opposition. If you cannot, then you don't have any any reason to choose that particular uh, that particular side. All right, let's keep going on 23. You're never going to believe this. I actually just finished a whole bunch of these, and I wasn't recording, so that was great. It was really awesome. And I sat here and talked to myself forever. Oh well, I was brilliant. Okay, number doesn't matter to you. Get on with it, Professor Bit. Number 23. Which of the following is not an argument made by J.S. Mill in our class reading of all minus one on liberty in favor of an individual's free speech? Okay. A, the opposing view may be true. B, dancing with bootstraps ensures safety. C, he who knows his own side knows little of that. And D, conflicting doctrines may share the truth. The answer there is clearly B, right? He doesn't talk about bootstraps or dancing, so that's a distractor. All right, 24 through 30, these last six are all Kant. And so, Immanuel Kant. So what I'm gonna do is, um, uh, I'm just gonna explain these a little more thoroughly than the last, um, but for 24 and 25, um, they have the very same options, pretty much, so, um, Let's start with 24. For Kant, the phenomenal world is A, really, really good. Phenomenal, in fact. B, the world as it exists independent of our experience. C, the world as it appears to each of us. 
D, wings in themselves, a new promotion by Chick-fil-A to capitalize on the teen fad of transcendental idealism now sweeping the food industry. E, that which underlies and supports the mode of extension. Okay, remember we want to eliminate bad choices first. E is a bad choice. This is actually a reference to something John Locke talks about, the substratum. We don't have time for that. It's a distractor. Wings in themselves, a silly joke that Professor Vitt came up with. It's a distractor. So now, let's. we've got three options here. A is going to be a bad one, right? Phenomenal. In fact, that's just a distractor. So now, we've got to decide between B and C. So we have to remember what the phenomenal world is. So for Kant, remember, there's the world as it appears to us. That's the phenomenal world, right? Sometimes you've heard about the phenomena of, that's as something appears to be, or something appearing to be. That's different than the noumenal world. The noumenal world is the world in itself, without reference to our perception, our cognition of it. So, the phenomenal world is the world as it appears to each of us, that's C. Now remember, 25 is very closely related that's another definition. Um, remember, the nominal world is the world in itself. So let's eliminate the bad answers. Remember, these will be mixed up and they'll all be changed for the final. A, really, really good. Phenomenal, in fact. Sings in themselves. That's a distractor. E is a distractor, so we're down to B and C. The noumenal world is the world as it exists, independent of our experience. That's 25 is B. All right, number 26. Clean asks Stephen Strange if, under Kant's philosophical system, there could be a noumenal piece of toast, like a piece of toast which is independent of our conception of it. Which of the following responses could Stephen Strange supply? So, could we have a noumenal piece of toast? Remember the slide where we say, oh, can we have a noumenal tree? No, you cannot have a noumenal tree because to say something is a tree is to already imply all sorts of things about time and space, biological processes, all that stuff. So, no, um, you can't have one. So that, that narrows our decisions down to B and D. B, no, this is because Kant permits individuated objects to be part of the noumenal world. He doesn't, but D is incorrect. So B is our best answer. No, you can't have a noumenal piece of toast because you've already applied the concepts and categories of the mind to the noumenal when you say toast. All right, oops, whoa, 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 I'm zooming in there. You know, I guess I'm just really good at zooming in and whenever I do it, it's all boom. Okay, sorry for the special effects. All right, we're almost there. You guys are doing great. Number 27, which of the following statements is analytic according to Kant's definition? Analytic means true by definition. What is true, the, the predicate is actually inside of the subject. So, um, bachelor is unmarried, right? That's, that's just the definition of bachelor. So the predicate is actually inside of the subject of the sentence. Um, so, which of the following statements is analytic? So we want a statement which has really a definition or a statement that is true by definition. A, all bachelors are citizens. That's not correct. Bachelors and unmarried male doesn't have anything to do with citizenship, so it doesn't help us. B, oranges are green. Again, green isn't part of the definition of orange, so it's false. It's not the right answer. Roses are red. Nope, roses can be white. Violets are blue. No, that's not quite right. E, all sisters are daughters. Now, D isn't an awful choice, but it pales in comparison to the splendor of E. And that's because it is the definition of a sister that that sister is also a daughter. It's just contained in the structure of the concept, in, of the idea. That's different from saying, hey, you know, I've got a father, but he's not a dad, or something like that. We're just talking about the meanings of the terms here. All right, number 27, or excuse me, 28 and 29 concern two terms that we didn't use too much. They're Kant's terms, so we'll talk about them. All right, <clears throat> why don't we take a posteriori? That means comes after. A posteriori means which of the following? A, knowable before or without reference to experience. B, knowable before or without reference to Sherlock Gnomes, until I have children. C, knowable by reference to inexperience. D, Alex Jones is probably related to Julius Caesar and therefore divine. 
E knowable by reference to experience. Okay, so it's not going to be Alex Jones. D is out. It's not going to be knowable. That's out. So we're looking at A, C, and E. A posteriori, that's not correct. That's not what that means. So we're looking at knowable by reference to inexperience or knowable by reference to experience. Our answer there is going to be E. A posteriori means it comes after, meaning it's after reason. It's knowable by reference to experience. It's Latin, but it's easy puntos on the final. So I encourage you to remember a posteriori means reference, knowable by reference to experience. A priori means which of the following? Our options here are really, really similar, but it's going to be knowable before or without reference to experience. It's prior to experience. Posteriori means after in Latin. So we have a priori meaning known before or without reference to experience. All right, number 30. Woo, it looks big, but remember, we're just going to eliminate bad answers first. And if we break it down into small bites, it will not be very difficult. All right, let's rock and roll. Kant's Copernican revolution refers to which of the following? Okay. Um, looks like they all have the same first question, except uh, the same beginning, except for D and E. So it's not enough to succeed. Others must fail. Google it. I mean, not really, it's just a quote. And D isn't quite correct. So D and E are out. So we're looking between A, B, and C. Now, if you're just guessing, you got a 30% chance. That's not bad. Um, so let's start the, with the first sentence, knowing that all three first sentences are the same. Copernicus discovered that the Earth revolves around the sun. This was a reversal of the way that people thought at the time. Okay, so that's each A, B, and C all have that answer. So now let's look at the next sentence. Kant argued that the world creates the mind using a forklift, and this idea was just as revolutionary as the Copernican notion. Um, no, he, he did not argue that the world was created using a forklift, so A is definitely out. Now we're down to B and C, just by carefully looking. This is a massive text. You've got to get used to doing that. Um, they, people want you to be overwhelmed when they write tests. Realize that you can eliminate bad answer choices and significantly increase your grade if you do that just by guessing. Okay, <clears throat> next sentence here. Kant argued that the mind creates the world in the sense that we can create physical objects and manipulate matter at will. Well, we can't really manipulate matter at will, meaning we can't just say, ooh, I want to make, you know, a gold bar. Boom, and I make it. That's not quite right. Um, so there is a sense that the mind creates the world. Why don't we look at C, that last sentence in C, and then check it out, right? We know we're between B and C. C probably is better. Kant argued that the mind creates the world in the sense that it organizes the world for us in important ways, and that's correct. That process, that organizational process, is fundamentally active, and that gives us C. So that's Kant's Copernican revolution, right? Instead of the world um, somehow creating images in the mind, the mind actually creates and organizes the world. That's Kant's Copernican revolution, right? He switches it. All right, number 31. Now, I've written out these basic answers here, and uh, I have just the bullet points, and so I would encourage you, oh, except for 35, which we'll do together. Um, the best answers will include all of these points, and so I put them all together. Now, if you just put A, you know, you might get some, some stuff, right? If you just put B, okay, you'll get some points, but the best answers will have all three of these. Okay, um, so there's 32 through 35. It's really only three short answer questions, four, and they're pretty straightforward. All right, number 32. Read the following passage, identify its author, and explain what he, she, they are talking about. Quote, to the person who seeks it, truth is immediately revealed. Indeed, he who investigates with pure intelligence set by the Creator in the heart of each man and scrutinizes the orders and laws of creation will discover the truth. Okay, who wrote it? Zera Yaakov. Okay, B. 
Um, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about how to how to reconcile differences that people just they seem irreconcilable. In other words, people disagree about the nature of religion or religious practice, and he thinks the way to resolve this is to look within and resolve it for yourself. Remember, everybody is a juror. Nobody here is a judge. So that's A and B, Zara Yacoub, and he's talking about how to reconcile these irreconcilable differences that people have. And this is, you know, this is a profound point. He's talking about religious difference. And there are, I mean, the history of organized religion is not entirely, but a big part of that is understanding how one particular branch is different from another, or how one sect of religious thought is different from another. And the question is, what do you do when you're torn between those differences? Zara Yacoub seems to think you rely on your own judgment. Number 33. Read the following passage, identify its author, and explain what he, she, they are talking about. Quote, had I lived before the creator of the world, I would have known the beginning of my life and of the consciousness of myself. Who created me? Was I created by my own hands? But I did not exist before I was created. If I say that my father and mother created me, then I must search for the creator of my parents and of the parents of my parents until they arrive at the first who were not created as we are, but who came into this world in some other way without being generated. Okay, this is Zara Yacoub. He's presenting the cosmological argument, and he's saying, look, some objects are contingent. That is, at one point they exist, and then they don't. This could continue forever until you will arrive at a first thing, and that first thing will be necessary. Um, this thing is necessary because it's not generated. Um, C. Leibniz also entertains an infinite series of contingent objects, but Yacoub's use of the term first seems to include not such an interpretation. This is for folks who really want to get the full points on this question. You want to highlight the difference between this author and Leibniz. And the idea is because Yacoub uses the word first, it sounds like mm, he probably doesn't mean an infinite series of contingent objects. Um, probably. So that's just a little side note, and that's just to get that higher points on that. All right, number 34. What, we've only got two left, you guys are doing great, and 35 is super easy, so. 34, what is causality? According to David Hume, what are two elements of the concept of causality? Okay, what is causality? It's just the relationship of cause to effect. That's all it is, it's cause and effect right? Um, B, the two elements are constant conjunction and necessity. Now you need to tell me, you have to name them, and then you need to stay, take one step further and explain what those are. Constant conjunction just means that these two events always occur at the same time. Necessity means that one event is always followed by another. There is no other possible outcome, right? So if you have one, then you're going to have the other. That's necessity. Constant conjunction refers to actual events, right? Um, and necessity refers to all possible events. All right, number 35. Read the following passage, identify its author, and explain what he, she, or they are talking about. He was just going to jump after him, but was prevented by the philosopher Pangloss, who demonstrated to him that the Bay of Lisbon had been made on purpose for the Anabaptists to be drowned. While he was proving this a priori, the ship foundered, all perished except Pangloss, Candide, and that brutal sailor who had drowned the good Anabaptist. The villains swam safely to shore while Pangloss and Candide were borne thither upon a plank. They felt the earth tremble under their feet. The sea swelled and foamed in the harbor and beat to pieces the vessels riding at anchor. Whirlwinds of fire and ashes covered the streets and public places. Houses fell, roofs were flung upon the pavements and the pavements were scattered. 30,000 inhabitants of all ages and sexes were crushed under the ruins. Okay, this comes from Voltaire, the French writer, and he's writing the book Candide. Now, what are they talking about? Here, 
Voltaire is making fun of Leibniz's claim that this is the best of all possible worlds. Um, and, and so um, there is tremendous death and hardship, but this is jovially or joking, maybe we'll say jokingly, contrasted with the idea that um, all of this had been made on purpose. And the idea here is that Voltaire thinks it's ridiculous to say that this is the best of all possible worlds, that somehow God had really envisioned all these consequences and was okay with them, because there were these clear accidents of nature that, that involved unjustified suffering, and it just seems bizarre to claim that this was really the goal. Right, that this was the best possible design or best possible world um, that God could create. All right, that's it. If you are comfortable with those questions, you will be fine on the final exam. Now remember, um, I am gonna change the order of the question, but I'm gonna change some of the silly answers um, so that they're different and the order of the questions. If you can do those, you can prevail on exam number two. All right, if you have any questions or concerns while you're prepping for this exam, please don't hesitate to message me and let me know. I'd be happy to answer those questions for you. Um, good luck studying, and remember, it's better to study for short bursts of time than it is to study for a massive period of time. So you're better off doing two 30-minute blocks with a 10-minute break than you would be studying for 70 minutes straight. Give your mind a break give it a chance to rest, and then return back strong. Okay, you guys, well done. Thank you for taking this course, and good luck on exam number two.